Hi, I'm Claire Brindis, and I'm the director of the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies. And it's a great honor for me to have the opportunity to introduce to you Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, who is California's first Surgeon General appointed by Governor Newsom. Nadine comes to her position as an award-winning physician, researcher, and advocate for the role of childhood trauma and its impact not only during childhood, but throughout the life course. Nadine's career has been dedicated to serving the most vulnerable populations in our communities, and she's bringing those experiences to her new role as California develops a number of initiatives around adverse childhood adversity and how we as a society can respond to try to change the trajectory of the future generations of our society. Thanks so much, Nadine, for joining us today. So Nadine, it's so exciting that you've become the first Surgeon General for the state of California. Congratulations. Thank and you. And I know it's been about a year. And I was wondering if we could start our conversation with you sharing, what is your vision for this position? How, what's attracted you to, to be our first Surgeon General? Um, that's a great question. For me, I think um, the opportunity to really uh, put social determinants of health front and center and to advance looking at some of these upstream solutions and integrating them across our healthcare and um, community response feels really critically important. I feel like we are at um, a moment in time when we have uh, the leadership of Governor Newsom, we have a supportive administration, and we have, fortunately for right now, a little bit of budget, um, where we have the opportunity to do some really unprecedented work. And as someone who came in with uh, having dedicated my career to addressing adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress, um, being able to put that to include that front and center, um, uh, in addition to a strong focus on early childhood and health equity, to be able to bring that uh, adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress piece uh, was really powerful and important for me. One of my favorite sayings recently has been something that I saw on a BART uh, um, station, and it said, leadership is not just about who drives the train, but who sets the tracks. Mm. And I'm wondering about how your early experiences as, as a champion, pediatrician, researcher, advocate, made you feel like we need to do something even more, that this is such a calling for you. Can you talk a little bit about your pediatric experiences and your own practices that led to this? Yeah, so that was actually, this is a fantastic question. I love this question because um, my experience as a pediatrician was um, I really feel like I, I didn't learn about adverse childhood experiences or toxic stress in medical school or residency. Uh, I really learned about it from my patients. And it was in the process of caring for patients in Bayview Hunters Point that I was seeing this profound connection between early adversity and negative health outcomes. And the funny thing about it was that when I then went to the powers that be, right, and I um, asked, you know, I, I shared what I had learned and I said, oh my goodness, do you know about adverse childhood ex experiences? What are we gonna do about it, right? And they looked at me and said, Nadine, we believe you, we think this is important, what are you going to do about it, <laughs> right? You turn uh, right back at you. It was, it was powerful for me to recognize that, um, that we really had to come up with the solutions. Mm -hmm. And the solutions lay in, in each of us, in the wisdom of the community, in the scientific community. But we had to do that work to bring it together. Um, so I think that for myself, 
I never would have, uh, uh, my first instinct was to look elsewhere uh, for that leadership. And um, the, the process of being a physician champion and a researcher um, really came out of necessity, right? Mm -hmm. um, and for me, what's been truly remarkable about it was to see, for example, the difference between, um, the, the difference that we can make, right? Like, mm -hmm. I remember when I did my TED Talk on adverse childhood experiences. I got up on that stage and my knees were knocking. Mm -hmm. And I said a little prayer as I got up on that stage. This is a true story. You know, I said, uh, I was so nervous and I said, you know, if this message can just move through me right now and go out into the world. And the goal was, my, my dream was that a million people would see that TED Talk. And now here we are five years later, over six and a half million people have seen it. And um, it's been, I think, an important conversation starter for a lot of folks. Um, and just to be able to witness that, wow, we actually can do this. We as individuals have the power to yeah. change public perception um, and response mm -hmm. was really, uh, it was encouraging for me. It's fascinating to me that you were encouraged to come up with some of your own solutions when we've been struggling with what to do about it. And not only do you have this award-winning TED Talk, but you followed it up with a book and the book is entitled The Deepest Well, Healing the Long-Term Effects of Childhood Adversity. And there you're aiming to educate the public in general, community folks, stakeholders, policymakers, and others. And I'm just wondering about the messaging in this book. Like, how, how, what's your dream <laughs> of how this book is gonna be used, not just here in California, where you clearly have a leadership role, mm -hmm. But how do you see this book being used? What is the message from this book that you hope will encourage others to take up the, the flag? Yeah, well, there's an old saying, when we know better, we do better. Mm -hmm. And that was really the goal for writing this book was to share the information with the public in a way that was digestible but also actionable. Because one of the things that we recognize and uh, we as healthcare leaders, I think, recognize this, is that we know we don't have all the solutions. And um, a, a critical piece for me as I was grappling with what does a response, a, a broad scale public health uh, response to ACEs look like? And one of the things I recognized was you know, I'm certainly not going to have all the answers, but when you put the when you put the basic information out there, the fundamentals of the information, and make it available uh, to as many people as possible, solutions start coming out of everywhere. It's just this really amazing. Uh, it, it was a really amazing phenomenon to experience, and so my hope um, for the book was that it would inspire conversations, and those conversations would lead to actions big and small. And, um, and that ultimately, that's the foundation of transforming our world. Mm -hmm. Well, another very big theme that I'm hearing you speak about is the economic impact on our society. Recent studies have shown that there's over $112 billion impact just in our state of California. Can you imagine the rest of the country? And economic arguments sometimes can make a tipping point for some individuals who may think, oh yes, Nadine, wonderful that you're thinking about this, but can you tell us a little bit about how you're using economics to try to change the conversation and who comes to the table? Well, I think one of the most important pieces, uh, and that, that $112 billion that we're talking about is per year. Right, so that's also and that's a billion, <laughs> billion with a B. Billion with a B 
per year in terms of the cost to the state of California from adverse childhood experiences. And part of the goal in highlighting the economics is to really underscore the sense of urgency for delaying, right? Lots of folks say, oh, I get it, I understand there's a problem, but it's not totally clear uh, you know, what exactly the solutions are, and well, maybe we should wait, and maybe we should. And um, for, for me, I think that um, as we move forward thoughtfully and in an evidence-based way, I think that um, the economic argument also helps to um, bring folks together regardless of what our, our um, uh, motivations are, hopefully bring folks from all sides of the aisle uh, together to recognize that we simply can't afford not to act. Mm -hmm. You have an amazing platform for giving this message out and will be very influential. I am wondering that apart from ACES, given that your life has been devoted to eliminating social disparities and increasing equity around healthcare access, mm -hmm. are there any other uh, themes for your administration that you'd like to be sure that you're also raising visibility about during this time? Yes. So. Um, the, th the three key priorities for uh, me as coming in as California's first Surgeon General are health equity, early childhood, and adverse childhood experiences, and toxic stress. And what's interesting is that I can call them out as three key priorities, but for me they're really indelibly intertwined. When we're looking at, for example, um, the improvements of, in maternal mortality in the state of California. One of the things that we recognize, while California has done an amazing job in reducing maternal mortality by 55% um, over the past uh, decade and a half, for African American women we haven't made the same gains. And as we, we haven't made the same gains despite implementing really rigorous protocols on addressing maternal mortality. And this is where we can look at the ACEs work um, simply as um, an early adversity issue, or we can really look at understand the biological mechanisms of toxic stress, I believe are also drivers of health inequities. Because what we recognize is that race, skin color is a risk factor for ad being exposed to higher doses of adversity, right? I mean, you, you, you can't be a black person <laughs> living in the United States without recognizing, or a person of color living in the United States without recognizing um, the, the way that plays out. Mm -hmm. and, and so when we do a better job recognizing, identifying, and characterizing and treating the impacts of toxic stress, then I think that we'll also see improvements in some of these uh, disparate health outcomes as well. I'm so delighted. As a Latina woman and an Im immigrant, I, your message really resonates with me. You know, it's so exciting that you've been able to launch such an important initi initiative in California. And I know that people who will be seeing this interview will be very interested to know what, what can they do? Where can they go? What would you recommend for them to learn more about what your initiative is all about? Well, thank you for that question. Would I, um, hey, we have created uh, a website called acesaware.org. And it's a very simple, straightforward way that any provider can learn about the ACES Aware initiative, uh, go to and download the tools for um, how to screen for ACES, what are the screening tools, what is the clinical protocol, the, the list of uh, ACE-associated health conditions that they can use as a reference. And also there's a little tab that says Get Trained. And so folks can click yeah. on the Get Trained and take the, the training that our experts have produced on how to screen and how to re respond with trauma-informed care. So I would drive anyone acesaware.org, I really recommend it. That's great. I'm really excited that apart from all your efforts around provider capacity and training, 
that you're also keeping an eye on the public and the community. Can you talk a little bit about the campaign, the public campaign, that you are all developing mm -hmm. and designing for implementation? So one of the things that's so important and one of the things that I recognized as I started my tenure with a statewide listening tour is that while many of our providers and our um, kind of social and educational safety net responders really understand adverse childhood experiences and the risk that they pose to lifelong health, many ordinary Californians really aren't aware. They don't necessarily know, oh my goodness, that if my child is in the home and they're witnessing domestic violence happening at home, that that can put their health and their development at risk. Mm -hmm. There's so many folks who believe, oh, they were little, they'll just forget about it. And so really being able to share the information about, uh, to help the public understand uh, that ACEs uh, can pose a health risk, but most importantly, what we can do about it, right? Mm -hmm. Because the data on buffering care safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments are so powerful that we want to make sure that that data is getting out there around how do we protect our kids from the effect of early stressors, and then how do we protect ourselves if we ourselves have um, experienced ACEs or, um, or even dealing with you know, the daily chronic stressors of day-to-day -day life. How do we keep from handing that down to the next generation? And how do we protect our own health? And so that's what we'll be putting out there in the public education campaign. I think that oxygen mask for adults will yes. be super, <laughs> super important in terms of as parents try to do the be very best work or job that they do in helping to nurture their children. And giving those positive reinforcing messages will be so useful. My last question is about measuring success. Mm. And these are really complicated topic areas, right? I mean, if it was easy, it would have been done. So what's your vision for what you would love to be able to see as sort of intermediary success notes, yeah. as well as your longer term vision? Yeah, so we have, that's a place where um, being able to uh, assess and evaluate our success is really important to me. And we have some uh, proximate measures and we have some more downstream measures that we're looking at putting into place right now. I would say our first and most immediate, most proximate measure right now is uh, the number of providers across the state of California who are trained on how to screen for ACEs and how to respond with trauma-informed care. That is a place where as we, you know, as I was able to su secure the commitment from the governor and the Department of Healthcare Services to invest in training our providers on how to screen and how to respond to, with trauma-informed care, I remember thinking to myself, wow, if, if this is the only thing that I do in my tenure as California Surgeon General, that I get, you know, every provider in the state or as many, even honestly, frankly, even 50% of our providers in the state to uh, be trained, understand, and, um, and implement uh, best practices for trauma-informed care, I'm like, that's kind of a big deal. Mm -hmm. So that in and of itself would be a success. So that's our first most immediate and most proximate measure is, is simply the number of providers who are being trained, and then of course we'll look at the number of providers that are screening. We're gonna be looking at the, the quality of the referrals and the connections that are made. We're looking at um, our ability to establish a network of care that's responsive to trauma and adversity as a root cause of uh, health challenges and health mm -hmm. risks, right? So all of those pieces as we go along the way we'll be measuring how well we're doing. That's so great. So it's been a real honor to have you uh, in this interview. I want to wish you on behalf of everyone really tremendous success because it's going to impact all of our lives regardless of which pathway we come to the table. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for your leadership and inspiration. Thank you.